from acclaimed television writer to successful showrunner, Los Angeles native Mara Brock Akil has been a leading voice in a new era of black entertainment. More than a producer, Mara is also a wife, mother, philanthropist, and mentor. Mara Brock Akil on this episode of Leading Women. Mara is extraordinary. Vivacious and um, inspiring. Mara is love. That's how I describe Mara. When she walks into a room, she brightens it up. And that's a cliche, but you'll see. I figured out in high school that I was a writer and that I wanted a career in writing. And so I decided, what are the best uh, journalism schools out there. I only wanted Northwestern and I only expected to get Northwestern and I got it. And I was a, a, really involved in my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, um, from my sophomore year. It's funny, my extracurricular activities in college is what led, had really started me on a solid foundation of realizing what a career would be for me because quickly I learned that journalism was not probably going to be it for me. And I thought, okay, well this might be a time to seek out a different career for my writing. Um, and um, I found, I found screenwriting. She has all these stories and things going and characters going on in her head and you know, uh, I knew that that was something that she loved to do and she took a huge leap. And somehow she got into this screenwriting class and that was it. So I think what happened was that screenwriting class at Northwestern just ignited her. I was done with college. I didn't need to go to grad school. I knew what I wanted now. Now I'm ready to go do that. And so I applied to all these writing programs in Hollywood just knowing they were, I was going to get accepted and I didn't. And so this was my first experience with like rejection. I realized how badly do I want Hollywood and um, I decided, you know, I got to go out there. You got to be, you got to be where your business is. First time I met Mara was she was a stage PA on the Sinbad show, which was a sitcom I was executive producing with Michael Whitehorn. Uh, for Fox. This is one young lady and she was always answering the phone, stage, can I help you? And I mean, just had the most engaging personality. And we started talking. I said, so what are you doing answering phones? She's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm answering phones now, but I'm a writer and these are my things that I plan to do. And turns out it was Mara Brock Akil. She was doing a great job as a stage PA. Everyone loved her on the set. So what, what are you interested in doing? I want to be a writer. Okay, well, Maybe down the road, if I have something, we'll call you in. And this is the one lesson I always tell people. Everybody is watching. They are watching. You don't. You think you have the bottom, no one's paying you any attention. Everybody's paying attention. Michael and I left um, the Sinbad show to do South Central. We decided to bring her on as an apprentice writer. And the next thing I know, they were like, okay, you can be a writer's trainee, and my life changed. Amara and I were hired on South Central and um, just clicked immediately. It was the best time. I mean, I'm working with Lorenz Tate, Jennifer Lopez, Clifton Powell, and I was like, I never want this to end. And of course it did. And I have my first experience with unemployment. And it was the first time in my life I had seen Mara scared. Eight months later, um, I'm writing um, a screenplay, um, an action thriller, and I asked, Ralph three months prior to that if he would give me some notes and Ralph says to me um he started talking about Moesha and he's just going on and he's calling his assistant in to give me a copy of the pilot and the script and I'm thinking and I said Ralph excuse me I'm sorry are you offering me a job and he was like looked at me like yeah and I was like okay pause I got up and I screamed. With Brandy being a young lady at the time 16 you know Mara was probably my youngest writer on staff and I really depended upon her to uh, deliver that voice. It was just a wonderful experience. I thank Ralph, Sarah, and Vita because they allowed all of us um, to experience every aspect of how to produce a show. I had been at Moesha for four years and had the, my first experience of being sought after. Warner Brothers wants me for two of their shows possibly, For Your Love and The Jamie Foxx Show. I consider myself a relationship girl. Clearly, I want to write before your love. I, the broad comedy is not me. They're like, yeah, but we want you on the Jamie Foxx show because we want to do an overhaul. On Jamie Foxx, I think that she did a wonderful job. I think that they hired her to give voice to the 
to the female characters, and that's exactly what she did. UPN found out I was out, out pitching, and what's, what's our pitching? And at the time, they had a hit in the Parkers, and they wanted a, a companion piece for that show. I plucked a character or two from these pitches that weren't going so well and wrapped them in the ribbon of something simple called Girlfriends that I just wanted to explore. I want to tell a story about um, the black women I know, and I don't think that they've been fully represented on television. She was so excited, and I remember her just being engrossed in, in those characters and that idea, and she had a very clear vision. Nobody wanted to be the studio for this project, to be the deficit financer for this. And there was only a couple that had money left on their, their slate, so to speak, for that season. One of which was Kelsey Grammer's company. We got a lot of press because people were trying to figure out what is Kelsey Grammer doing with a bunch of black <laughs> women? Like, what, what's going on here? And he responded, you know, he did smart comedy. This was a smart comedy. When it got picked up and I saw it on TV for the first time, I, I, I did cry for her because, <laughs> I'm gonna cry now. Um, because she, because she did it. Right. Girlfriends, to me, broke so many barriers and so many stereotypes. Um, and it was very important for us to see fly, young, African-American women that were ambitious, that were working, that were positive role models, but they still had issues. It addressed issues that are particular to African-American women, like fibroids, um, skin color issues within the African-American community. It addressed that. It addressed HIV and AIDS. It addressed loneliness. You hadn't seen that on television before, right? To see a show about four black women who are friends, who have four very different struggles, really just like life. It's like when I watched the pilot, I was like, Mara, that's you. Like, everything about Trace's character was mine. I checked in with Kelsey one day and I said, hey Kelsey, I think we need to talk about a spinoff. Let's go in and we had lunch. And he's like, yeah, I think so. Let's go in and go sell another show. And um, I quickly came up with the game. This is the game. Woohoo! <laughs> Delta, take one. Don't tell me. Two cameras, A and C only, marker. Hola. Hola. I love sports, but one of my favorite things is when they pan to the um, audience and you get to see who they're married to or who they're dating. I always wondered about how those women felt, who they are. When I first heard about the, you know, the, the project, you know, uh, the game, I fell in love with the character. I fell in love with Melanie Barnett because I felt like I was a lot like Melanie. When I got the script for the game, I read it and it wasn't, I, it, the words just rolled off my tongue. The way Mara writes, I feel like she writes for all women. I feel like everybody can relate to the issues that she's going through. Very early on, I saw I was noticing, wow, she's she's different, you know, for a showrunner. There's not many people uh, in positions of power who are, who are also able to just be cool. Getting to know her a little bit more throughout the process was really interesting because she's really hands-on um, as an executive producer. From Kelsey to Mara on down to Salim, to the cast, to the crew, where it's like, this somebody pinch me and wake me up because like this this I can't this can't be work. The interesting thing about the game, I call it a hybrid of shows because it's you know it's comedy, but then there's drama. There's an intent and a seriousness on the foundation of the game of girlfriends. So that not only are you being entertained, you're also engaging everyone in a conversation. It's like a one in a million shot to get your show in the air. And she was young when she did it. And then to then have the game on, like two shows at the same time. Mara's success, I think it goes beyond just uh, something important to African-American women. I think her success is something that women of all colors and ages can aspire to. Birdie, birdie, take one. Oh shoot, I messed up. Birdie, birdie, one, take one, CNY camera. Yay, Mara! <laughs> When Mara was born, uh, 
She started off with a thirst and a struggle for life. But I'm a mixed breed between Los Angeles and Kansas City, Missouri. Um, uh, it's the dreamer in me is Los Angeles. Um, and the hard worker in me, I think, is Kansas City, Missouri. We moved to Kansas City um, when she was in the third grade. And every summer, the children would come back uh, to Los Angeles. I was surrounded by incredibly strong, independent, fiery, <laughs> women um, who just let me be me. I lived in my imaginary world. I didn't have imaginary friends, I wanna be very clear. If it wasn't what I wanted to be, I just plopped myself into the world I wanted to be in and I just would live in it. That's when I became a writer. Like where I am today began then. She loved to, to play and pretend. My mother was very, she was very open. She's a child of the, um, the radical movement, and the, you know, the, you know the, growing up in the late 60s and 70s and we talked. We talked. I remember, I felt, put it this way, I, my, I was close enough to my mom that I approached her about when I was ready to have sex. I just told them before I knew they were even thinking about sex. Okay, when you start thinking about it, and you will, and you'll have these experiences, just know it is safe to come to me. She totally redirected that conversation, and from that, I, she, uh, I didn't have sex for like a couple more years after that because she knew how to talk to me, she knew what my buttons were, and knew what was gonna stop me from from doing it. We would be girlfriends if we weren't mother and daughter. I mean, I can't say it any better than that. How did I meet Mara? A friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, basically introduced us. He asked me out on this date, and I accepted not so much because how gorgeous he was, but more so because it was the lineup. It was a jazz. I had recently discovered jazz, and Cassandra Wilson was in it, you know, went Marcellus, and I was like, yeah, I wanna go. We went out, uh, had a wonderful time. By the end of the night, it was late, one of those nights where you walk around the block. Um, she said, you know, it's time for me to go. I said, okay, fine. I said, but let me ask you this. And he finally says, so Mara, what would you say to me if it were a year from now? Because right now I'm saying, okay, good night. I'll see you later, I was trying to say that. He goes, what would you say if, if we were a year from now, what would you say? And immediately, tears welled up in my eyes. Got these big tears in her eyes, and she said, I can't say that. Now, this is the first date. And I said, well, no, you should say it. And she said, if it was a year from now, I would probably say, I love you. And he says, well, I love you too. So why don't we get about the business of this beautiful relationship and forget about all the BS that comes with dating and all the the dance, that the stupid dance that people do, and let's just get on about our lives together. Three months later, Mara asked me to marry her. And at that moment, I knew, okay, I'm gonna be with her forever. The unique thing is that not only they're married, but they, they work together and they create art together. So that's a, you know, that's like having two marriages in one. They are um, inseparable, inseparable, and he is her, um, they're each other's best friends. She and her husband, Salim, get to work together because he's a director and a writer as well. And they have worked so closely together, some on Girlfriends, but very closely on the game. We're constantly talking about ideas, constantly helping each other with each other's individual projects. Just It's just a part of, you know, some people talk about politics all day or sports. That's just part of what we talk about. It's not work to us. It's just, it's our breath. We work beautifully together. There's hiccups, but um, we love each other too much, too much to let hiccups become a problem. We have our, our battles, but you know, that just makes up for good makeup sex. You know, it's, it's, it, it's passionate. They're just pushing each other to succeed. That's just a beautiful thing to see. Yassine is five years old, and Yassine came, um, I know the day we conceived him, I know ever, I, we were waiting on him. His name is a, a surah in the Quran, and it doesn't technically have a meaning, 
but Surah Yasin is considered the heart of the Quran, and the idea of his name is that he is the heart of us. Nasir is the happiest baby. He's five months old. He's the happiest baby ever. He wakes up smiling. He goes to bed smiling. He already has a relationship with his brother. It's just amazing. Um, Yasin is a great big brother. He's always checking up on his little brother. Watching her with uh, my children is like watching honey melt into tea. It's just sweet, quiet, pure, soft, and gentle. I love being the queen of the household. You know, got my king and my two princes. It's funny, when I had Nasir, I thought, how am I gonna be able to love him as much as I love Yassine? And I thought Salim had all of it, and then now Salim and Yassine have it, and now Salim, Yassine, and Nasir have it. And then it's just, it's, just, it's infinite. It's, it doesn't necessarily get bigger this way, it just gets deeper this way. As a mother, the love is boundless, and Mara is so passionate about those sons that she would move the world for them. Having my children has also brought my father back in my life in a wonderful way. We haven't, um, we've had a very uh, unique relationship and it's getting better as a result of having, having my boys. But I was recently approached by um, an executive um, who actually left Hollywood and started uh, a project called the Samburu Project. She met of um, the Samburu tribe. And they're a group of women who, for many reasons, and it's, it's it, whether they were abused by their spouses, um, but nonetheless, these women are here. It's a refuge for them. They've banded together. They're escaping bad situations. And one of the through lines of why they're in the situation that they're in is that there is no water. It's this one thing that's missing that's causing all of these problems. So Kristen Kaczynski got involved and she started the Samburu Project. We had previously worked together and she asked me to be involved. And the first thing I did was, well, let's just buy a well. So basically the Samburu Project is about building wells. The local people from the community are helping to build the wells. So they're learning skills as well as being employed to do so. And it provides clean drinking water for um, tribes in, in, um, in Africa. Mara, in particular, encourages um, a whole generation of uh, younger women and men who, um, you know, want to do what she's doing. She opens doors. I always told Mara, um, at some point, people are going to forget that she's human and they're gonna look at her as a building you go to to get a job. She's so accessible, she's so willing to talk, she's so warm, um, and so willing to give um, advice and information. For people who wanna do what I do, um, one, believe that you can do it. Two, have a vision. Um, be yourself. A lot of times people come to Hollywood and they're chasing the fame and the fortune. You'll know, you won't laugh. You might get in, probably won't last very long. So have a vision, have a point of view of the kind of storytelling and images that you want to uh, pursue and love it. You have to do the work. If you're a writer, you have to write. Keep writing. There's, there's no excuse, you can write anywhere. Mara is a good role model because she's accomplished so much, but she's maintained who she is. There's so few female showrunners and even fewer black female showrunners. And this is a woman that had two shows on the air at the same time. You know, that's unheard of. Mara is a great example for any woman that you can do it and you can do it tactful. You can do it in a way that um, represents your culture, you know, your sexuality everything in a positive light. Mara is definitely a force to be reckoned with in this business and in life. Mara's greatest accomplishment is to keep, to me, her her soul and her values and her, her, her right and wrong. I think Mara's greatest accomplishment is uh, her ability to hold on to her faith. What's next for Mara? 
is at anything she wants to do. I think we can look forward to she and Celine together building um, a, a production company that is going to be a company that does work that we will be very happy and proud to see. I see Mara creating, writing a hit in the big theaters. I feel like I have a lot more television in me. I love the medium of television. A couple blockbusters at the box office. Um, kids successfully through school and happy and well adjusted. Keeping my marriage happy and sexy. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I, that's what I see for my future. Oh. You look really pretty today. I do? Mm -hmm. Thanks. You know you look pretty. Well, so do you. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>